Good afternoon and welcome to this bright talk on digital transformation in the financial industry. Firstly, let me say thanks very much for joining us today, uh, taking the time. We know that you're, you're all extremely busy and your time is valuable. My name is Russell Skingsley. I'm the APAC Chief Technology Officer for Hitachi Data Systems. And today I'm joined by Michael Araneta, who is the, an Associate Vice President at IDC, responsible for financial insights. And also Linda Zhu, who is our Vice President of Solutions Marketing for what we call Emerging Solutions here at HDS. Many of our customers are talking about digital transformation, and there are many common aspects that apply to many industries. But today we wanted to take this discussion specific and specific to the financial services industry and specifically to APAC. What does digital transformation mean to your industry in your location and how can HDS help you with your aspirations in your digital transformation strategy? Before we start, let me just um, remind you guys, let you all know that you're able to ask questions in your browser We'll be leaving plenty of time at the end of this for questions. And so do put them in there. Don't be shy. Uh, we'll, we'll get to them. Um, just as you go, as the questions sort of come to mind as we go through these presentations, uh, just put them in that um, area there and we'll, we'll, we'll answer them. So let's kick this off by handing over to Michael from IDC with his take on the role of data in regards to digital transformation in the financial industry. Over to you, Michael. Thank you very much. Uh, good day to everyone. My name is Michael Arenetta, and I represent IDC Financial Insights for Asia Pacific as head of research. I am very excited to talk to you today because I will be presenting our thoughts and the interesting industry developments that we anticipate in the year ahead, especially as we look at how financial services institutions, primarily the banks that we cover so thoroughly at IDC Financial Insights, will make progress with their digital transformation initiatives. We at IDC refer to digital transformation as DX, a sort, a sort of shorthand for the many opportunities of transformation that various industries are taking and the many dimensions in which such transformations are being seen. So my role today will be to present to you what IDC Financial Insights has seen as key things to watch in 2017. I will be presenting findings from our most recent research and surveys and reports. My intention is to provide context to the presentation that Hitachi Data Systems will be presenting on how, in fact, despite many key factors of success, it is in our discipline and mastery of data in terms of the overall management, but also in terms of storage, collection, security, and analysis of that data that we will succeed. So it is good to begin by recognizing the work that banks have had in terms of data in 2016. And very quickly, I can say that 2016 has been a big banner year for data in Asia-Pacific banks. I will be presenting statistics and numbers from our research to prove that throughout the course of this webcast. Let us look at our data about data in greater detail. 2016 has been a very good year because in terms of IT spending, we note that there has been an upsurge of investments in terms of data. On a year-on-year -year basis, there is a new 7.8% benchmark in investments in anything related to do with data. And here we put together not only infra-related spending, as in storage, but also in terms of data warehousing. And then in terms of the flow of data, also included here would be analytics and services around data management. If you add in the huge jumps in investments for security, it is easy to see why the 7.8% is higher than the 6% average IT budget growth in 2016 over 2015. Perhaps the most impressive case would be in how there has been an estimated 35% growth of digital transactions in the top 250 banks in the region. We see this in bank after bank and in country after country that are crossing thresholds of digital adoption. And this is a story of scale. We know that the more transactions come in, the more will be the need for institutions to handle this throughput of data well. We thus predict that we will double our storage requirements from now up to 2018. 
Other trends we are witnessing, the industry is seeing a 12% growth in terms of data sources. So banks are collecting data from new third parties, whether it is marketing companies or credit bureaus for better sources of credit decisioning or even in new operational data. The sources of data used in the business of banks are multiplying from structured to unstructured data, uh, from machines, humans, sensors, and so on. There is an 18% growth in terms of institutions that are actively using unstructured data. This is mainly to innovate on customer experience by using, for example, social media information, videos, and text to really engage with the customer. Consequently, and overall, we have seen a 75% growth in terms of customer data that is collected, stored, and then managed, although it is a different matter altogether how and if this data is analyzed. Other uh, meaningful data that we have um, would be the emergence of data lakes, regulations that would require longer data storage. And then finally, we see that in 2016, there has been a 50% growth in the adoption of cloud in Asia-Pacific financial services. This calls for better planning of resources and improved procurement cycles for compute storage and network assets. So a lot more focus is definitely given to how we manage data and in storage and other infra assets moving forward. In the next few slides, I will talk about more insights from our work at IDC that point to how data management is going to be an even more important area of development in 2017, and I will highlight five key themes. The first theme is that we should be ready for even more data upsurge. Currently, we are seeing Asia-Pacific markets crossing multiple thresholds of digitalization. Smartphone penetration rates are up. You've got um, digital channel activity rates going up, and digital stickiness is even getting more significant. Record-breaking trends in digitalization will persist in 2017, as 100% of banks will now have a mobile strategy by 2018 and definitely a digital strategy by then. But one thing that is very interesting alongside this rise in transactions is that the customer is becoming more multi-channel. Traditionally, customers used only two channels when dealing with their bank, either by going directly to the branch or by using an ATM. This was so true in 2004. However, now with the emergence of new technologies, there is a growing number of channels by which customers deal with their bank not only by way of the branch or the ATM, but now also via the web and on PCs, via mobile phones and tablets, as well as by way of wearable technologies that are being launched every single day. By 2020, we expect banks to manage at least 18 channels, most of them digital. Also important to note, not only is the customer becoming multi-channel in that they use an increasing number of channels to deal with their bank, but beyond this, the bank too will have more proactive interactions with the customer. The big implication is that data that we can gather about our customers are going to increase, but the overall effort has fallen short for many organizations. The number of digital transactions has exploded to such an extent that in 2015, the banking industry saw a 40%, 40% spike of severity one and severity two instances simply because they could not cope with the upsurge. In Asia Pacific, channel interactions, primarily those over the mobile channel, will continue to grow by 22% per annum between 2015 and 2020. Sadly, the trend of outages will continue in 2016 and 2017 as institutions struggle with their goals of resiliency, availability, as well as security. The next development we are tracking is how 65% of top 250 banks have now a working single customer view in 2016. It was very interesting to speak to a bank the other day, and they were saying that finally, finally their work is done, but we came to the conclusion very quickly that their work is in fact far from over. The need of the times is for banks to enhance their single customer views by adding more data about the customer, whether it is data that leads to insights in me analytics using social media, personal IoT information and geolocation, or whether it is in better customer data integration to understand family and household relationships among accounts within the bank, or the use of third-party data. 
At IDC, this is very interesting. We have been talking about how soon, probably in 2018, but most likely sooner than that, enterprises with strategic DX initiatives will expand the number of external data pipelines feeding intelligence into their organizations, but at least three to five fold. Relevant here would be credit bureaus or data intelligence feeds for fund management, data on customers, especially those that are high risk and highly contributing to the business of the bank. Also interesting is that banks, too, will expand the delivery of their own monetizable data to the marketplace by a hundredfold or more. So enterprises' ability to innovate will grow and shrink in proportion to their data supply. It is clear to see that, yes, the volume, the types, and complexity of data we have to manage will grow significantly. Another related trend that we are tracking is that the industry continues to see the emergence of what we call lifestyle banking, with banks moving away from offering products to instead offering value-added services that complement the lifestyle of their customers. This products plus service proposition is driven by two main objectives. The first is the bank's intention to differentiate themselves given the commoditized products and services and channels that are flooding the market. But secondly, uh, there is a bank objective to offer hyper-personalized products and services that simplify the decision-making process of customers. In order to sell a product, having it in a portfolio is not enough now. Banks need to offer it to the customers at a time when it is relevant, at a place where it is needed, and in a way that is easy and readily, readily consumed. So in which areas is this idea of lifestyle banking taking hold? We see this develop in areas that are still closely related to financial services. But over time, we expect services enabled by third platform technology such as cloud to move further away from the core of banking. A great example is in aggregation services for mortgages. Another great example, banks are already starting to work facilitation services driving uh, traffic to their partner merchants. Taking this thought further, banks can offer travel planning following a ticket purchase with the credit card that is offered by the bank. Also, advisory services are expected to move beyond high-end wealth management towards the mass market and are likely to expand from a pure financial planning perspective, include other areas such as card payments, education, health and insurance, and tax optimization. The clear impact is that as we expand our business, we too will be creating more data. But more importantly, we have to optimize the use of data assets, whether it is ensuring that future businesses refer to the same but expanded single customer views. But we also centralize and standardize as we can to modernize our IT infrastructure. We go next to perhaps a long-standing uh, issue in our industry, and that is uh, the industry has become resigned to the fact that the uh, necessary evil, uh, quote-unquote, of compliance is also an escalating one. In 2016, the average growth in compliance spending was 26%, and this has been growing at that level for at least three years. In 2017, we expect mandates to come from all fronts payments, payment security, reporting and resolution of IT outages, which frankly is very timely since, as we earlier mentioned, the trend of IT outages is getting more adverse. You've got cloud and IT outsourcing guidelines, data privacy, and know your customer guidelines, especially for corporate banking. So this explains why 90% of regulatory compliance is a major concern despite banks' increase in investments. Looking at some data management issues in specific, we note concerns regarding data backup and recovery. Banks are spending two to three times more on backup rather than on storage, mainly because backup has been the highlight of many BCDR guidelines of regulators, and banks continue to struggle to complete backups on time, distracting them from the work of actually running the bank. So we come to the birth of this concept of smart compliance, which is the fruit of how many organizations, how management will look to monetize risk and compliance spending for other purposes. 
But to be sure, this use what we have effort was initiated many years ago. But the extent to which risk and compliance assets have matured might mean that many institutions will see more success in 2017. For example, many firms have aggregated customer information and transaction data to improve their risk and compliance analytics. Banks will also need to provide reuse of data for compliance for business, whether it is in loyalty or uh, segmentation or predictive analytics. The scope of data we have has improved significantly. In many institutions, social data, particularly on corporates, um, has expanded significantly. In corporate banking, for example, information on adverse media of our customers has been an intensifying compliance requirement. And these data will provide much support for sales and marketing to improve customer retention and marketing programs. Of course, we are realistic. So data ownership has been and will continue to be very traditionally managed in most organizations. But we expect this to change somewhat for the better as 60% of CIOs now and 63% of chief risk officers in Asia Pacific banks see data as a strategic and not unit specific asset. So everyone should be able to use that data. To this end, we know that it is important that banks can provide, for example, disk based right ones read many capability to protect data in an altered form through file authentication, retention, and logging so that there is governance around that data. Banks should also allow integrated searching and indexing of the archive, including search of file content. So we like this trend of compliance, a data reuse, of course, as an average, less than 48% of data collected by Asia Pacific banks um, is ever analyzed. So greater usage means that the ROI for investments in data infrastructures um, will finally scale and that compliance does not remain a black hole of cost for many institutions. How else do we define a smart compliance? In a recent infographic that we published with uh, HDS, we note how banks need to comply with specific high-priority regulations like EC Rule 17A-4, Basel 3, Basel 2, Dodd-Frank, and ensure that they work with solution providers that provide ready propositions around compliance to these very specific guidelines. And the final and fifth trend we would like to focus on would be that of smarter decision making. There are many reasons for this, but it is the requirements of customers around frictionless customer experience that is very important. Very simply, the customer expects to deal with their bank with minimal experience disruption, such as frustrating uh, authorization, slow response times by the frontline staff, or inefficient security checks. Not only are banking customers becoming multi-channel in that they are using a variety of different channels in dealing with their bank, but related to this, we also find a growing trend of customers banking in a variety of different times and locations. With the mobility of banking today, customers are banking in the context of or amid the activities of their day-to-day -day lives, while waiting for a bus, for example, or while shopping, while at a fair or a coffee shop, banking transactions are now being done. What the customers expect is being able to readily access the bank and its services at any time with no resistance in experience. The technology requirement here is for staff to have access to data from multiple locations and devices, and it is important to have an on-premise file sync and share for convenient and secure solutions for, say, mobile users of the bank. Furthermore, banks need to provide customer-facing employees a more detailed view of customers and prospects to improve cross-sell and upsell. More importantly, banks should let users of this data know what this new data means and how they can use this data in their line of work, but more importantly, in the decision that needs to be made at that point in time. We encourage banks to design new compliance and risk systems with data reuse in mind so that aggregated data can be accessed by other departments in the firm. We also encourage banks to use a lot of marketing data that are being collected across multiple product silos to be used and accessed by other departments in the firm. The strategic implication here is that banks need to develop new ways to democratize decision-making so that when a decision is made, it is made where it is needed by the right person. The IT implication is efficient data discovery, but also efficient access management, good security, and better insights being brought to the frontline decision makers. So there you have it. 
to be a five tree trends that we are tracking that really define how data is at the heart of the digital transformation initiative of 2017. Uh, we are anticipating the continued expansion of data about customers that require scalable IT infrastructure, reliable and secure uh, infrastructure, and so on. The second point, uh, we need to focus on building ecosystems of data where w there is continued effort to enhance single customer view programs, relying on API, open API architecture, relying on data pipelines in and out of the organization. We're also tracking more data as banks expand business. So banks will be creating more data themselves where they really need to look at how to modernize data infrastructures. Smart compliance is a very big trend uh, where compliance data is being used as a business resource uh, and you are able to build customer intelligence from compliance data. And fifth, focus on quick decision making where speed to interaction is very important, where improved analytics is very important, but more importantly, I think it's the devolution of decision making to where it needs to be made. So the key message is that um, in 2016, we've seen a huge upsurge in data. It has been a big year for data and it has been a very exciting year for data, but it will be a much more exciting year in 2017 as we expect even more data that needs to be managed, data that will be more comprehensive and expensive. We're looking at using data for smart compliance and more efficient decision making. So very exciting times ahead. At this point, I'd like to pass the floor to Linda, who is the VP of Emerging Solutions Marketing for Hitachi Data Systems. Thank you, Michael. And thanks, everybody, for listening to uh, today's presentation. Again, you know, my name is Alinda Shu. I'm the Vice President of Emerging Solutions Marketing at Hitachi Data Systems. And welcome to uh, this portion of the presentation. So just now, Michael talked about why you know, customers are going digital, why digital transformation is critical for a lot of the, uh, the business. So um, from uh, really our point of view, I'd like to build out this slide. We see our customers um, pursuing digital transformation really to try to accomplish three major outcomes. So my apologies for the, uh, the build. Um, one of the, uh, the outcome customers are looking for is really operation and process improvement. How do they achieve cost savings and accelerate time to market? And the second one here is really around customer experience. How can they increase customer loyalty through improved customer experience? And the third one here is really around business models. How can um, customers uncover new revenue streams and reach new markets? So these are really the three business outcomes our customers truly want to accomplish through their digital transformation. And I'd like to also uh, introduce really from a Hitachi uh, stand standpoint our strategy to how do we enable our customers uh, in their digital transformation. So I um, just want to build out the slides here. So at HDS, we offer our customers an integrated and secure way to manage all their data because data is a truly the, uh, the foundation for digital transformation, as Michael just talked about. And our view is that we want to enable our customers to manage, govern, mobilize, and analyze their data in a secure and integrated way. And ultimately, they can turn the data into insights and use the insights to uh, drive better business opportunities for business and also for society. So that's an overarching strategy from HDS to enable a digital transformation. And I also like to uh, do a very quick overview of the, uh, the portfolio that we're talking about here. So uh, you know, simply put, and we offer um, Simply put, we offer an end-to-end -end platform for all your data. So this portfolio consists of um, our Hitachi content platform, or HCP, 
That's our core object store. And uh, our cloud gateway solution, which is a solution that can be used at the edge or as an on-ramp to the cloud. And our sync and share solution, HCP Anywhere. And tightly integrated, this is a, really a platform for all your data from any source, structured data, unstructured data, IoT data, or data from different applications from any location, from the core of the data center to the edge, all the way to the cloud, and from any mobile device. So this is a truly a platform for all your data. And centralizing all your data into a single digital repository is only step number one in your digital transformation. So what's more important is also how do we enable our customers to align your data with business requirements so you can innovate with data to gain insight from the data. So ultimately, the insights that um, you know, really power your digital transformation are generated through um, data analytics. Hitachi actually holds more than 2,000 patents for analytics technology. So this is the most of any company in the world. And we also um, acquired Pantaho, uh, you know, which specialized in data analytics. And this acquisition further enables our customers to integrate data from all the different sources and also blend and integrate data for analysis. Then a customer can visualize the output to really help business users uncover the value with the insight that can you know, help them monetize more, innovate faster, and reduce risk. So with that, I'm going to uh, drill down into a couple uh, examples that how our customers globally have been using our technology, our solutions to advance their digital journey. So the first example is around banking. So you know, I'm sure um, we've all seen really news reports like this. It's very, um, um, you know, very often we see that banks are being fined for inability to uh, meet regulatory compliance requirements. As Michael just mentioned, smart compliance or compliance is one of the, the top challenges and top issue. So as, you know, these are just a couple examples. The top one, RoboBank. Um, RoboBank happens to be uh, uh, one of uh, HDS customer. So uh, Rubble Bank faced a lot of uh, challenges. In addition to the compliance challenge that we just talked about, there's also the competition from FinTech, um, really you know, very fierce competition from all those uh, newer FinTech you know, companies. And how do they grow? Right? The only way for Rubble Bank to grow is uh, they wanted to enter into new business area. But the challenge here is that when they, when they were doing market study, when they try to launch a new uh, service, the, uh, they built a business case. And the cost of meeting the rigid regulatory compliance is so high that they will never be able to be profitable if they uh, enter into that new business. So they actually turned to HDS for a solution. So what we offer them is a digital governance solution, or in Michael's uh, words, and a smart compliance solution powered by the Hitachi content platform, our object storage. So it really gives the compliance team the tools to truly work more effectively and more flexibly you know, to meet all the regulatory uh, investigation requirements. So as a result of that, they're able to uh, expand. Uh, really setting some new standard for compliance investigation, um, you know, where other institutions are really following their example. So on the operation side, um, because of the digital governance solution, they're able to centralize 
and more importantly, automate a lot of the compliance uh, activities because of the power of the technology with all the, um, all the uh, compliance features and functionality to ensure, to ensure um, all, the, uh, all the regulatory requirements are met. So the new approach enabled them to cut the time needed for search and indexing and discovery um, for all those activities from weeks to hours. So that's a tremendous amount of cost saving and speed to, uh, to market. And the other, um, the other metrics they use is they improve the overall accuracy for the investigation by, uh, by 10 times. And because of that, they're able to cut down compliance-related costs dramatically. So they're able to uh, launch their new service for more revenue, but also do it in a profitable manner. So just now we talked about a, uh, you know, uh, the banking business, and we talked about the tremendous amount of uh, challenges or competition from fintech. So let's you know, shift the gear to talk about uh, one of our fintech customers here. So what well, this customer is um, you know, based in, in the U.S., and they are a true pioneer in digital payment. So this is um, one of the, the segments in, uh, in the fintech Sector. So like all the other fintech companies, they really compete on speed to market uh, innovation and they thrive with customer experience. That's really the key here. What they're trying to do is uh, they're building a global payment system. Um, but you know, because of the scale, the sheer size, scale, and speed of the growth of the data, Make, made it very difficult for them to rely on traditional architecture, like you know, think about the traditional scale-out file system, and it was impossible for them to um, um, to really meet the um, the needs of the the high growth of data, the complexity of data, and so really outpacing the technical capability of any of the traditional architecture they've been using. Um, they really require a different architecture. And so the, the one they turn to is, um, is uh, HDS object storage as a, a modern way to really modernize their infrastructure. You know, for example, their DevOps team also need a platform that can support you know, today's cloud-based protocols to deliver the merchant and consumer transaction reporting dashboard that can include predictive analytics, right? So um, um, by deploying a centralized data hub based on Hitachi content platform, they centralized all the data from uh, the user files, machine data, and merchant transaction log, and all of the different data types. Uh, the key here is metadata. The metadata augmentation to the objects truly provided for the necessary association of data to the application. So it's like building a cloud um, database. It's so more than just you know, pure traditional storage. So today, they have a multiple petabyte of capacity running, and they're able to lower their IT cost by centralizing all their data into a single digital repository and provide management, access, and mobility control for all their data, and also uh, you know, enable their DevOps team to provide customers with real-time transactional reporting. And in addition to that, they improved their customer experience as well, because customers now can upload and access all their receipts via their mobile device and they're able to access anytime and anywhere for their convenience. And lastly, they can also analyze buyer spending behaviors, their transaction processing, and uh, they can use all those findings about their customer uh, you know, as part of the customer 360. They can offer customized services based on the customer's you know, 360 profile, truly you know, become more um, innovative and, and offer more services that's more sticky to the uh, to the customer. So this is a, a second example. This one 
So really, you know, for a pay tech or part of the fintech, uh, really customer base. Um, now let's also, you know, shifting gear into um, insurance. That's another segment that we serve in the financial sector. So this customer is a um, one of the largest insurance companies in the world. Um, they were experiencing a lot of um, challenges in fraud management. So their estimate is they, they spend roughly um, $3 million in fraud, or wasted rather, uh, per month. So they really wanted to take that under control. And to do that, they really need to have a better handle of all their data. So they wanted to tag their content, their data, more effectively so they can manage it and eliminate the fraud. And um, you know, because of the industry they're in, the, um, the, the encryption is a key requirement for their data management. And furthermore, they have some uh, internal chargeback you know, capabilities. They have a system that enable them to do that that's already in place. So uh, they wanted to leverage that. So the uh, a solution that can provide pay-as-you-grow, pay-as-you-go pricing model. So when you put all of that together, they really felt uh, public cloud or you know Amazon is the solution of choice. So they can um, truly you know be able to handle their growth, but also do a you know pay pay-as-you-go kind of a financial model. So they decided on Amazon as the uh, the solution. But not until they read um, some of the, the fan print of the contract, it, this is a case of what you don't know can truly cost you because uh, when they add on the cost of bandwidth, when they add on the cost of encryption charges and all the other data transfer, you know, data transfer costs, it's really adding up. And it doesn't, it's not as economical as they thought, originally thought. That's when we actually turn to HDS for alternative. Um, initially, when we started to pitch our uh, Hitachi content platform, our object solution, they actually they were very hesitant because um, they already had a EMC Centera solution uh, in-house. And uh, they mentioned you know, that's not really what they're looking for. They're not interested in an, a similar like object store. And that's not going to meet their needs. But we actually presented to the application team the capabilities of a, a modern object storage like HCP. And we showed them that in as little as 30 minutes, they could point the data on their uh, content management solution that's customized in-house. Um, they can point all the data on this you know, content management solution to HCP via the S3 protocol. So this was a powerful solution because it really meant with almost no additional development cost, data can be stored on site securely um, instead of in the cloud. And the customer also follow, followed up with their own TCO study. So this is a customer analysis. And uh, they analyzed over the, the course of the project the HCP private cloud will be 20% less expensive than Amazon when you take into account all the add-on cost, right, the hidden cost, encryption, you know, bandwidth, and all of the above. So, this, so they decided on um, a, a private cloud powered by HCP. But the beauty here is um, HCP is also architectured for hybrid cloud. So they can start with a private cloud, but it's ready for hybrid cloud if the customer uh, choose to go that route, because uh, it, you know, HCP enable customers offer the freedom so customer can burst out into Amazon or Microsoft Azure or Google Cloud if they if they want to, and the metadata are still safely stored within the firewall within you know, HCP, and so which means IT can have full control and visibility of the data while at the same time you have the freedom to burst out into public cloud when you need to. And that way we truly enable them to transform their IT department into a data broker. So this is just another example 
of um, um, really HDS enabling customers' digital transformation through a cloud solution. So with that, I'm going to uh, hand over to Russell to go through our use cases in Asia Pacific. Russell. All right, thanks very much, Linda. A quick reminder to the audience, if you have any questions, please uh, type them into your browser. We'll, we'll get to answer, answering them after this. Um, what I want to touch on right now is three real-world use cases for APAC. Now, I can't, I can't mention customer names specifically. We don't have their permission to do that in this case. But I felt that all of these served as useful examples of you know, what we've been talking about here on this call today. I'm going to start with um, a large Australian bank. And when we first spoke to this customer, they had a massive head headache around um, Dodd-Frank compliance. And um, they had a requirement to store, retain, safeguard every single piece of data that was in any way related to trades from any of their customers. And they were dealing with a large amount of data sources here as well. They were talking about over 100 data sources to deal with um, to be able to comply here. And in addition, Dodd-Frank compliance meant that the system had to support uh, write once, read many at a, at a very low level to be able to support the, um, the compliance requirement to ensure there was no um, data tampering. Um, and in our opening conversation with them, they pretty much said that this has been such a headache for them that if we solve this problem for them, then you know, they'll buy it immediately. And um, that's, of course, music to our ears, and that's exactly what we did. Um, we spoke to them about how object storage would provide them with a repository for all of this data, how it would be able to provide them with uh, write once, read many technology. It would give them the ability to be able to instantaneously retrieve data rather than having to retrieve it from tape. And um, it was you know, built with a, a massively reliable erasure coding capability, so it was extremely robust. Um, and it's built around an architecture that is um, highly scalable at a, you know, in a cost-efficient way. And so we were able to solve this problem for them. And we also strongly suspect that what's going to happen with that object store is it's going to, it's going to grow and take on other, um, other duties as well within that customer. For now, however, it's fair to say it's, it's really revolutionised their lives in regards to Dodd-Frank compliance. And this is, I guess this is a good example, a classic example of uh, what we were talking about earlier in terms of reuse, not just uh, meeting the compliance requirement, but discovering that once you actually have the data on tap, that there's other things that you could do with it. You're keeping this data to be compliant, but actually now that you've got easy access to it and you've got the ability to be able to run analysis on it, you might actually be able to infer some useful things from that data that could be monetizable. And so it, it's that smart compliance, it's that reuse, and this is a very good example of that. And it's fairly representative of the types of conversations that we're having with a large number of customers around object storage. It tends to be introduced as a way to fix a particular problem, but the potential of it is that it can pretty much become a compliant repository of, of everything an organisation knows. And that's, that's very powerful once that's in there. Okay, next up, um, a leading ASEAN-based bank. This bank was looking to examine their options in regards to building private cloud, and they were looking at uh, the open source world, open source hypervisors, to complement their commercial hypervisor environment. Problem was, they wanted enterprise grade redundancy. They wanted enterprise grade resiliency for the data. Um, and um, they needed something that was not going to be hypervisor dependent to, to provide that, obviously, because they're looking at a multi-hypervisor future, if you like. Uh, this issue was really proving to be a significant barrier to their private cloud aspirations. We implemented um, HDS's global active device, and that gave them dual site redundancy mechanism with zero recovery time, regardless of the mix of hypervisors in use. So this is one of those things where we lent on our core competency in terms of data resiliency to be able to solve a problem for them 
in regards to their digital transformation aspirations, which was to be able to build out this uh, private cloud capability on open source. And once we've done that, that really enabled them to move forward with their cloud modernisation plans. Next up, a Chinese securities company. And this is a conversation that we're having, type of conversation that we're having quite often these days. Their staff needed access from mobile devices. They wanted to be able to get access to their data from anywhere, basically. Uh, but the company wasn't really willing to accept a public cloud-based solution for this type of file sync and share, primarily from the concerns of um, security, who, who actually has access to this data off-site, etc. The company also realised that um, it wasn't only a security question mark in regards to these public cloud sync and share solutions, but they also realised that if they had this situation go on where people were more and more putting their data on their mobile devices, syncing them to some kind of public cloud, they were actually proliferating the creation of this dark data. This is data that they couldn't have access to in terms of for their own uses, for things like being able to run analysis on their own data. And if you think about this yourself, um, this actually quite often is the most relevant, most recent data. If you think about your own life, most of your most important stuff is right on your laptop because that's the thing that you're currently working on. I think this organisation realised that having this only on the laptops and only in the public cloud from a sync point of view was a lost opportunity for them. So HDS provided um, an, an enterprise grade sync and share capability where the data lived on premise. Um, using a unified object storage um, strategy. So they now had ownership and access to that data that would have otherwise been dark, um, but they didn't inconvenience their users in any way. They provided them with the, the same type of sync, sync and share capability that they would have wanted to get from, from the public cloud providers. And, you know, incidentally, uh, this alleviated the need to back up the devices of those users because now you are, you are encouraging them to use the sync and share directory as their home directory, that creates an automatic backup of the data that they're, that they're using. And so you can actually save in terms of not needing a client backup solution necessarily once you've in, implemented that. And this is, um, you know, these are three examples of um, how HDS have been helping um, our customers with their digital transformation aspirations. Okay, um, I want to move on to the Q&A uh, quickly, but I just want to summarise you know, some of the key takeaways, I guess, from what we've heard today. I think it's probably fair to say that useful data from various sources is growing exponentially. Uh, what we heard earlier was something like we'd be expecting that to grow something like three to five times in a very short period of time. And I think it's quite obvious that the ability to leverage that data is the essence of digital transformation. That's why people are, are talking about digital transformation um, uh, so often these days. It's how do I, how do I um, leverage that data um, for uh, new services, monetization, etc. Financial institutions really need to take on a strategy to be a broker of that data. You know, they're already, for um, compliance purposes, keeping that data, but what if that data became something much more useful than just, um, just um, for uh, complying? The strategy that they employ needs to cover aspects in regards to management, governance, mobility and analytics. Um, there's a lot of data to retain. You need a way to control that data. You also want to be able to make that data accessible from anywhere to anywhere. And most importantly, you want the capability to run analytics on that data um, to be able to realise the potential of that data. And really executing on that strategy becomes a competitive advantage. If your competitors are not doing this with their data, then there's a good chance that, that you are making inferences about customers that perhaps they aren't. And finally, of course, since we sponsor this talk, we have to say that HDS, you know, we've assisted many organisations with digital transformation strategies, um, their data strategy specifically, and of course, we'd like to help you too. So 
I've actually got some questions um, in the chat box now, guys, and I'll I'll start with this first one. This one was quite interesting, I thought. Um, in the new ecosystem of data and multi-channel banking, is the demand of IT infrastructure different from traditional banking? If so, what's the difference? Michael, would you like to, to have a shot at that? Yeah, so this has been an ongoing question for a lot of um, institutions we are tracking. And our advice is that um, the effort to centralize data into a single data repository that's happening already anyway, in even in this uh, multi-channel integration effort, uh, should actually continue. And that needs to be prioritized. And they should not uh, really uh, step off the pedal um, in this particular regard. But I think moving forward, a lot of institutions will need to acquire new data and centralize and optimize them as quickly and effectively as possible. And most of these will probably be um, acquired through open APIs. So banks will have to re-architect their uh, data infrastructure, their, their software um, layers as well to be able to accommodate this real-time uh, third-party data that they're acquiring uh, very quickly. Um, I think moving forward, they also have to consider issues around security and compliance to be able to assure uh, that they um, really look at the veracity of the data, for example. So there are a lot of not only uh, infrastructure and, uh, and uh, technology issues that they have to resolve, but more importantly, they have to resolve issues around data ownership, security, compliance, and culpability, um, just in case the, those new uh, data that they are acquiring would actually be not uh, re not meeting veracity requirements that is very crucial in financial services. Okay, thanks Michael. Um, next up, besides object storage, HCP, does HDS have other solutions that can assist customers in their digital journey? Linda, would you like to attempt that one? Yeah, absolutely. So great question, by the way. So uh, um, I think when I uh, presented one of the slides, we talk about our overall, it's a portfolio um, approach to handle all your data need. There are four pillars to that. Uh, the first one is the data management. Second one is the data governance. The third one is the data mobility. The fourth one is the data analytics. We actually have solutions um, across the entire four pillars of data. And today, just because of it, this is uh, really targeted for the banking uh, and financial sector, uh, and compliance is a huge issue. That's why I think all of us you know, spend more time on HCP-related solutions. But the, the, in reality, we offer solutions in data management. You know, for example, software-defined infrastructure, our converged solution that's you know, truly automated and also integrated with the different application solutions and it's fully virtualized, right? So that's a data management. In data governance, and we have full suite of a data protection solutions like your copy management and, uh, you know, to all sorts of like a data replication and security, all of the different solutions there. Data analytics, I think I touched on very briefly about Pentaho. That's a solution we acquired and Pentaho is a, a really specialized in data integration data, you know, visual, visualization, and also, you know, then integrate, you know, Pentaho with the different parts of Hitachi, um, Hitachi solution, customer can truly turn their data into insight. So they really do a lot of uh, data analytics. And beyond that, we also have a Hitachi insight group. They offer different types of uh, IoT solution for customers who are ready to embrace, you know, from just IT into operation technology, into IoT, into machine data, artificial intelligence. So it's a full suite of solution. You know, today I think we focused on certain aspects of that because we really see HCP or Object Store as that foundation for um, modernize the current infrastructure and innovate with data. So that's a bridging kind of a solution. But to answer your question, yes, we do have a full portfolio of uh, solution, I would encourage you to uh, contact our team for more details in the other area. Okay, great. Okay, next question. In the data, in 
In the area of data lake, compliance and data backup, what's the major advantages of HDS? What solutions uh, that HDS can provide at the moment? Thoughts on that? Um, yeah, so, uh, okay, great. So, again, you know, great question. So I like to, you know, highlight a few things. You know, from a technology standpoint, just now we talk about HCP more from a uh, use case standpoint, like how it's being utilized. But from a technology standpoint, this is by far probably the best solution you can find um, to meet uh, regulatory compliance requirement because HCP in its origin, it was built for compliance, for archive. It is actually being used by uh, um, U.S. You know, National um, Archive. You know, we all are watching, or just now I was just watching the presidential debate. So all the president's um, documents and uh, records and uh, emails from all the president, that's, you know, being uh, archived on HCP-powered solution. So that's how secure and that's how powerful and uh, compliance ready the solution truly is and really speaks for its, uh, its capability. Technology-wise, you, know, you know, it does offer temper-proof uh, capability with uh, write ones and read many in the warm capability and encryption that's really meeting advanced encryption standard algorithm. It also allows you to set different policies and different access retention policy and automate how data is can be managed, audited, and so we'll offer audit trail in, you, in case you really you know are, are being uh, investigated for certain things and you can offer the whole really life cycle of you can show proof of all the data, meaning like it's not being tampered, it's not being um, it's not being altered, right? And you can show all the record of that, and uh, you know you can also you know de um, have set policy for data deletion um, based on the requirement. If you need to delete the data, you know, after seven years, so you can set a policy to do that. The other thing that's very powerful about HCP is it has built-in metadata query capability. So that way you can, you know, enable you to search across all the data um, without putting unnecessary resource, you know, strain on IT. It also has a self-healing capability and it's, you know, replication and with erasure coding protection. So this way when you put everything together, it really substantially reduces the need for, for backup. And backup, you know, is one of the top challenge, you know, as well as uh, I think Michael mentioned early on in the presentation. So again, you know, this is a, a really a proven, um, proven solution for archive, for protection, constantly being ranked at the very top by the different um, industry, you know, thought leaders in the different, you know, different uh, reviews. So uh, definitely encourage you to look into our solution more so and be happy to, uh, to engage, you know, after the, the call as well. Outstanding. I've got one more question here, and this is a this is a really broad question, actually. It's in regards to security. It says, as discussed, security is always a major concern when we're dealing with FSI data. Nowadays, we see and hear a lot of security issues, for example, ransomware or ATM security breaches, etc. So, what are some of the key approaches that you suggest us to look at in terms of enhancing the security um, issues for FSI? Now that, that's an absolutely huge area and um, I think probably one of the things that, that needs to be considered in regards to security is that security really needs to be something where you take a very um, a comprehensive approach across all aspects of the infrastructure and the data and policy, all of those things combine to, to give you a good um, security profile. Now the thing is about um, HDS in particular, we're not going to cover all of those aspects of security. Some of those things are related to physical security, some of those things are related to network security, etc. But we do have a very pragmatic approach to how we would implement security on the data side. Uh, just to give you an example about you know, potential strategies, ransomware is mentioned for example. Well, if you have the capability to be able to very easily and rapidly move a server back to a state where it was before it was infected with, 
with the malware that enables that ransomware to occur, if you can do that rapidly, quickly and reliably, then you can pretty much blunt the effects of ransomware. But I think the, the overall message is security is not necessarily a quick fix. It is something that you need to approach strategically and um, look at all aspects of your, your infrastructure to, to uh, ensure that you're adequately covered. Okay, um, we're at the top of the hour. Um, thanks very much for the thoughtful questions for, for everybody and thanks very much to our presenters for today. Um, really appreciate everybody's time on, on this call and um, hope to catch up with you all in the near future. Thank you very much.